My name is Richard Thompson. Uh, I am the editorial director of Mead, and I will be your moderator for the next hour for this live stream discussion uh, on the digital transformation of oil and gas and petrochemicals and manufacturing plants in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, this webinar is brought to you by Mead together with uh, Maya Technemont, uh, and we have a fantastic panel of experts uh, from Meyer Technemont and Siemens and Leonardo, who are going to um, present their thoughts on the digital transformation and how it can accelerate and ease the energy transition in the region. Uh, and I invite you all to take part in the conversation and to submit your questions using the uh, comment section on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and I will try and moderate your questions as best I can. So um, the purpose of today's discussion is to look at the challenges feigning, uh, facing owners and operators of oil and gas and other manufacturing plants uh, in the Middle East. Um, owners are always looking to maximize operational efficiency and operational output. And of course, we have this uh, huge new priority around the decarbonization of the economy without interrupting uh, output and growth. What we're going to look at today is the, the, the strategic importance and value of digital data technology in achieving those operational efficiencies and uh, the decarbonization of plants as well. Um, and we're going to look at specific technologies, you know, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, uh, and how they can be uh, utilized to deliver things like predictive maintenance and more predictive uh, operations. Um, but we're also going to look at some of the risks, and in particular, uh, the growing importance of cybersecurity. You know, if we are living on an interconnected data environment, uh, clearly it has to be secure for us to achieve the efficiencies and the benefits um, that we want to achieve. So, uh, as I say, please uh, join the conversation, send in your questions. It's a very, very important topic, and we have a fantastic panel uh, of speakers uh, to talk about the topic. So I will now introduce our panelists. We have four experts, uh, leaders in their fields, uh, joining us today. Uh, Giovanni Sala is the Senior Vice President for Commercial and Business Development and for Group Strategy at Meyer Technomont. Hi, Giovanni. Thank you for your time. We also are joined by Hi. Max Manaro. Uh, Max is the um, Vice President for Group Organization, uh, Information Communications Technology and System Quality at Meyer Technomont. Hi, Max. Uh, welcome. Thank you for your time today. Um, alongside Giovanni and Max, we have uh, Maurizio Rovalio, who is the Head of Digital Enterprise Business for the Process Industry at Siemens Digital Industries. Uh, hi, Maurizio. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, and last but not least is Aldo Sebastiani, who is the Senior Vice President for uh, Cybersecurity and the Digital Competence Center. So welcome, Aldo, and welcome to all four of you. Thank you very much for Thank giving you. us your time today. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to come to Giovanni first. Before I do, I'd just like to remind you all, we really would love to have you involved in the conversation. You can send in your questions uh, using the um, comments tab on the right-hand side of your screen. You can see the text field at the bottom. Send in any questions you have or even any comments you have for the panelists, and we will, we will try and get as much of that into the conversation as possible. Okay, so uh, Giovanni, if I can come to you first. So you are Senior Vice President for Commercial and Business Development and Group Strategy at Meyer Technomont. So I'm extremely interested to hear about your insights, not just about the challenges, but also about what it means for Meyer Technomont and other EPC players, traditional EPC players and engineering players. So perhaps we could start. Uh, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges facing plant owners and plant operators uh, today? Thank you, Richard. Thank you, for, uh, first of all, for hosting us in uh, our webinar. I mean, uh, uh, I do believe that... Uh, our target uh, today is to contribute uh, to give uh, content on uh, all the rhetorics uh, we are listening every day 
about digitalization and perhaps uh, the energy transition. So, as a matter of fact, the owner operator has to manage a different business model that uh, is imposed by an historical discontinuity in our world, that is uh, the energy transition. So, how to do it? How to be different? How to create a value in a totally new environment? For sure, we need to, it is the easy things, to enjoy what is uh, the massive data management and computing the power that our device has. And that's uh, nearly, that imposes us to be digital or to be natively digital. When we are not talking about investment or revamping or change, let's say, the paradigm of the production, we need to be natively digital. We cannot be with the new plants, with the new installation, without taking into account uh, what uh, the industries of the digitalization offer us. Then another point that the, the owner and the operator has to manage. This discontinuity will bring uh, the production units not to be designed on a steady state condition. They will be more effective to the transient steady condition. When I was a young chemical engineer in the university, we were always pitched on the uh, economy of the scale to have a plan that has to run on the steady condition to minimize the maintenance, to minimize, let's say, the wearing of the components of the critical chemical. Now the energy transition leads on something definitely that is not more steady. Our earth, our earth every day, stay. so the, it's no more something that we can enjoy just plugging uh, in the networks. We need to manage it in a different way. So that's imposed more complex digital system and computerizing system that can manage it. Last but not the least, to do that, obviously we need to understand that the new products has to have uh, a kind of uh, green stick on it. And to sell the green stick in a different cluster of uh, macroeconomy that is now developing the world, you are hearing every day about taxonomy in the European Union, about US authority that are now changing the paradigm of the energy in the in USA. And China is even, and China that is even moving towards a different economy in a, such a massive market. How to certify the quality of your product that can enter the border of the cluster that now the world is creating? It's not more a matter to have a credit card. Cards, that somebody can certify the transition just moving the data from one book to the other. You have something that to be shared. So you need to enter in a kind of blockchain environment that all the data on the FISTO, the certification of the FISTO, as well as the certification of taking, has to be considered compliant with the taxonomy that is in European Union or in USA or in China, or in Japan. So that's me to deal with a different FISTO. Last but not the least, the FISTO will no more, more oil and gas. The FISTO will be waste. Waste, sometimes we are reading, is the oil of the future. But to deal with the waste, it's something that is definitely a different uh, mixture of components. It's not just oil and gas, but it's something that uh, the district where you live Produce. So your plan has to be flexible enough to recognize the different fist of this kind. Things about to go from the waste to chemical. Do you think it's just to have a, a simple columns, a simple furnaces? No. There is something that has to recognize the complexity of the fist of the waste to go through 
let's say, the furnaces and the pyrolysis, and then the classical uh, uh, units for, for the production. If, thank so, you, Giovanni. If I, can, if I can just ask you on this point about waste is the new oil, I, I'm quite interested because the, obviously this is we're getting into sort of chemical engineering here, but I, I, how presumably that introduces questions of fuel efficiency, energy efficiency, the the, the quality of the waste, and we. I mean that sounds like it's quite advanced technology. Are we at a state? Are we ready to do that today? I mean, uh, uh, Richard, I I spent part of my career in Japan, and, and uh, the waste uh, uh, to to chemical was something that was in Chiba factory since long time ago. There are nothing new under the sun. In terms of uh, chemistry, in terms of pyrolysis, in terms of uh, understanding uh, how to manage uh, the thermodynamics on the kinetics in, uh, let's say, dismantling the, the products and getting the pyrolysis oil that they can be uh, they can enter again in a furnace in the crack. The issue that nowadays our society has to do is to link the dots, because yeah. one thing is if you live in a district that can produce the kind of uh, waste well, let's say, certified, and the, the totally classification of the waste that can easily manage by the plants. So I mean, you are not buying a washing machine. The washing machine, you don't even think. You buy it, and then it's just a matter to put inside something, you get something outside. This kind of plant is not a washing machine. It's to be tailored to the district where you live. To live in, uh, in Abu Dhabi is different than to live, uh, I don't know, in, uh, in Muscat. The, the kind of waste could be different. But uh, Milis, a unique discontinuity. It's becoming an area where they are consuming and that become an area that are entering in the energy transition in a different way, in a different sense, if I, if I can recycle. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Giovanni. Just on, the, we, we're slightly squashed for time. Um, you talked about joining the dots. You know, it's a com you, you mentioned at the beginning of your comments that we're talking about complex systems, and you've talked about new technologies and the need to join the dots. Is that where the the the, the EPC players will evolve? Is you know, we've, we've talked, we want to talk about the future for the EPC sector and the systems integrators. Is that the role that needs to evolve in the industry? It's, it's a player, entities who will join the dots and manage this complexity. Yes. So this is what we are, we are trying, for example, in our group, what we are trying to do with our back called NextCam, is just to join the dots of the different components of this uh, complex uh, equation. So... That is the role of the PC contract. It will not be just uh, a, who can get uh, one cubic meter of paper well designed by somebody and has to execute, but has to start in understanding and join the dots from the power grids, the kind of energy, how to certify. It's a different role. This is why we say the business model of the owner is different. The business model of the PC contract will be broader difference, wider difference. And we have to be a one-stop shop solution on that, that we can deal okay. with the different district that we are. Uh, okay, so one, one final question then uh, to you. So you've talked, now, you've talked now about the changing business model for EPC contractors and the need for that integration role, systems integration role. You've talked about the need for blockchain to, you know, to certify processes and ensure security. You've talked about the potential of new fuels, waste to waste to fuel, uh, waste to chemical. Um, all of that means doing things differently. That in the Middle East, that's always been a challenge to change. You know, we're talking about huge investments and big, big operations. What is the attitude in the region? How do the plant owners and the operators, are the, is there a desire to change or is it going to be quite difficult? Uh, we are experiencing uh, a, a really a revolution. I mean, uh, from my point of view, in the Middle East, we saw 
We saw what is doing uh, uh, Adnok in terms of new vision. Uh, we saw what we are doing in Oman, even in, in Kingdom, Saudi Arabia. They are really repositioning themselves. They recognize that they have a span of time to change their business model. They will not burn oil to fuel. Oil to fuel will not it exists for a, a very period of time. The, the, the precious of the oil, because remain precious resources, has to be dedicated to the petrochemical. Oil has to go to petrochemical. But the, the, the meaning, the, 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 the possibility to move to all hydrogen, sustainable hydrogen, and sustainable ammonia is a new vehicle for the energy. We already experience it in Oman, in uh, Abu Dhabi, in Kingdom, they are moving because they can enjoy, obviously, energy, renewable energy. They can enjoy the availability of the gas. They can enjoy a very structural industrial state. So think about, uh, again, how to shape the business model to serve the taxonomy that will be soon exist in Europe, US, China. Korea, Japan. Japan is who is now creating the market for the blue ammonia, the green ammonia, because they want to go to an hybrid scheme of feeding the coal-based power plant. So now the biggest market for the blue and green ammonia is Japan. But you need to certify it. Again, how to serve this first market. But very soon, there will be Europe. Why I need to import? that ammonia that has to be sure that is a green label or the blue label or a turquoise label, because also nuclear power can be even considered. The okay, Giovanni, thank you very much. I'm going to step in there because I want to bring... All the cluster of taxonomies that we receive very soon in the world. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Now, these, there's a lot of content. Um, if you have questions for Giovanni on any of these issues, and I know that certainly green hydrogen and the potential of the hydrogen market is a, is a huge topic for, uh, for the region, uh, so use the, the comments box on the right-hand side of your screen to send in any questions for Giovanni or any of our other panelists. So thank you, Giovanni, for your comments. I want now to move to Max Panaro. So Max... Uh, uh, Panaro is the uh, Vice President for Group Organization, ICT and System Quality at Meyer Technomont. Uh, Max, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Um, just we've heard from Giovanni, you know, the, the potential, the opportunities and also the transition that we're going through. Um, what do you think industrial plants are going to look like? Twenty, If we sort of look 20 years, 30 years ahead, what what is it going to look like? How is it going to be different than what we have today? Well, thank you, Richard. And of course, thanks to me for hosting such an interesting event. And actually, thank you very much for the opportunity to answer this question. Uh, in fact, the question of what will the industrial plants will look like in 20 or 30 years is a great one. I will start from the next 10 one, okay? Um, our uh, knowledgeable audience knows that the plants in, in the next 10 years will be different. Hmm? The next plants that we will build, realize in the next 10 years will at the same time be, as Giovanni said, natively digital. That's for sure. And second point, they will be designed in green color. There will not be blueprints. There will be Green prints. Uh -huh. These two mega trends for, for some players uh, are considered mega threats, if I may yeah. use this. Uh, but as Giovanni uh, has uh, clearly depicted, we share with our clients and, and our partners a different perspective. Uh, Myre Teknimont is proposing the concept of uh, next plant hmm? as the vision uh, that we want uh, to pose to the market to leverage uh, the green on one side and the digital transition to make, design, build industrial plants that are more efficient, more resilient, and more profitable. Uh, 
the point, uh, uh, Richard, I would say is Myre Tecnimont uh, this, uh, has this uh, next plant approach uh, with the design uh, to target to meet the, the expectation to have an OPEX efficiency in the range of 30% by 2030 in 10 years. Of course, while matching the needs of the energy transition, hmm, as Giovanni was describing. Sorry, Max, if I can just ask, so you are saying that the, the, we the owners and operators can achieve 30% efficiencies within a decade, so they're wasting 30% at the moment, or there there is 30% inefficiency today. Is that what you are saying? I would say that uh, it, there is no magic formula, no? I mean, it, it's not to download an, an app from, from the app store. So it's, it's not something that you can just uh, uh, realize in on one day, but there is, uh, and I come back to one of your points uh, uh, that you asked Giovanni, it's the conventional, I would say, uh, traditional work of cooperation between a client with, a, with an industrial view, a reliable contractor, that orchestrate the contribution of the best partners in order to design these future-proof industrial plants. If you are interested, if, 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 our, if our guests are, are interested, we might elaborate on how do we get there. Well, that, that was exactly what I was going to ask you, Max. So, you know, 30%, that's a huge, huge saving. How do we do that? I mean, is it through predictive maintenance? Is it through using robots instead of people, you know, what? how do you make that level of saving? Of course, uh, Richard, uh, this is every plant uh, and, and every owner have different characteristics, different priorities. Uh, so um, I will elaborate on some of the general drivers that then are mixed in a different uh, proportion, case by case, okay? Uh, well, first of all, uh, in coherence with the carbon emission reduction objectives that uh, the global policymakers are putting in our agenda, all the technological uh, players and the equipment manufacturers are committed to a strong reduction of uh, the energy utilization. And we all know that uh, uh, energy utilization is uh, a cost. Uh, uh, to, this is a, a trend that has to be understood and embraced in the plant design from the early design phase. As Giovanni said, the contractor role changes. The contractor is, is a partner in the early design phase. I make you an example. If I take I take Stami Carbon, which is my retechnement group licensor in the urea space, the, the ultra low energy technology that we have recently released saves between 30 and 40% of the energy consumption for the urea production. That's, that's, that's the, a major cost in a in a uh, OPEX of a urea plant. And the same commitment is in the agenda of all the technology licensors and also the equipment manufacturers. The second point, so, so th this is one of the things that uh, the energy transition is helping everybody to achieve the also saving targets if well interpreted. The second point is the, the arti artificial intelligence put in practice. Uh, if today the process optimization, no? leveraging the conventional thermodynamic uh, equation is able to unlock uh, improvement of productivity in the range of uh, 10%. <clears throat> we see, because we are experimenting this, uh, further potential to be exploited with uh, a wider and integrated perspective. Giovanni said uh, something that is very clear. The engineers like me, like Giovanni, have been trained on uh, models on steady state, we know that plants, and especially the plants of the energy transition, do not work at steady state. So artificial intelligence will be one of the levers that will help us to gather even more from uh, the plants that we run. And artificial intelligence is also powerful in the uh, operation and maintenance. The maintenance costs reduction in facts, in practice. I mean. Uh, this is a, uh, something that we have been applying. We have partnership with major technological uh, uh, leaders, and we applied on, on the field, on the plants, also in the Middle East, for example, in Oman. And we see that uh, 
it can reduce really the risk of production stop, the loss of uh, uh, cost, uh, the loss of assets and cost of unplanned maintenance. This is for real. This is. Uh, so is it your, your, um, I mean, obviously, my techmont is coming from um, from an EPC engineering background, and you mentioned just now, you know, there are tech companies that are, you know, do, producing all sorts of software uh, on the tech side. But you, I think, the point you're making is that. It, the engineering background is essential for this to, re, you know, you, you can't just buy off the shelf technologies. Is that the advantage for the EPC players moving into this space? Perfectly, perfectly said, Rich. Um, we feel that uh, the role of the integrator of an EPC doesn't change in itself, no? But it evolves. There is a transformation because the connecting of the dots is what the, the EPC contractor has always done in the past. Now, the EPC contractor uh, has the duty and the privilege to connect both physical and digital dots on one side. So just one quick question, Max. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm sorry to interrupt. You know, in... What's the difference between, so if the EPC contractor moves into this integrator space, the digital integration space, but traditionally, once the EPC job is finished, it's, you hand over to the owner or the operator. The operator does the facilities operation. What is the difference between the operator and the systems integrator? Is that not the same thing? No, I, I, I wouldn't say so. I would, I would say that uh, um, the, the asset operator, the asset owner, is a different industrial uh, uh, model, but what also uh, also Giovanni said, and I am fully in line with with Giovanni, uh, the relation between the, the the asset owner and the operator and the EPC contractor change, change because it's crucial that EPC contractor works earlier together with the uh, the asset owner, and it is crucial that. The EPC contractor follows up later with the asset owner, but having the role of the partner of the asset owner, co-designing and continuously improving an asset that is run by an asset owner. Of course, then there can be a role in supporting the asset owner to, to, to run the plant, okay? Because when you have uh, the digital lever, for example, we can support uh, our our clients in understanding how to better run the plant because the plant is hyper connected. You will we will see with the, Mr. Rovaglio how important it is that the plant is hyper connected to wireless five G uh, infrastructure so that things can talk to things. Things can provide information for artificial intelligence, and also a player like the the system integrator or the EPC contractor can support the asset owner to optimize the operation. And this Fantastic. is happening. I'm going to jump in there, Max. Thank you very much. I want to bring in uh, Maritza now. But if anyone has any questions, we have some questions that have come in already, and I will get to those once we've been around the panelists. But please, um, if you have questions from Max or Giovanni or any of the other panelists, uh, use the, the the box on the right-hand side of your screen uh, to send in those questions, and we will, we will get to those towards the end. OK, thank you uh, very much, um, Max. I want to bring in uh, Maurizio Rivaglio uh, to join the conversation. Now, Maurizio is the head of digital enterprises for the process industry at Siemens Digital Industries. Maurizio, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, so we've heard about the, from Giovanni, the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, and we've heard from Max about the sort of timeline and the potential savings and efficiencies. Uh, what are the key technologies, in your opinion, uh, that, that we need to have installed to deliver this this transformation, you know, uh, Giovanni mentioned um, blockchain, for example. Max mentioned artificial intelligence. What what do you think is uh, is key to all of this, Maurizio? Uh, first of all, thank you, Richard. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, webinar. 
Um, you know, the let me start from uh, a point uh, where uh, I mean I think everybody is really sensible today. You know, the pandemic period we are crossing, on top of the enormous pains inflicted uh, to all the global community and the big difficulty it has generated. Uh, for the different type of business. I believe it has also pushed some different uh, type of scenario of innovation, introducing a new relevant uh, economic opportunity as uh, actually we are, we are mentioning, you know, the, all the transition in terms of digital, in terms of green and so on, you are in some way have been already, you know, boosted uh, by this type of uh, this uh, difficult period. Uh, in this sense, you know, all those business strongly linked uh, to the digital innovation model, uh, they got a kind, as I say, boost in order to maintain the creation of value, you know, uh, you know, intact even uh, in this type of physically uh, limited, uh, you know, connection and, and world. Uh, some digital value, and coming back to the point of your question, you know, is essentially based, uh, you know, some the digital, you know, value is based on uh, three main, uh, let's say, pillar of technology, you know, the connectivity, as we mentioned, the, the analytics uh, and the cloud. So, which can be translated in, in other words, in the capacity, you know, to collect the data, to extract, uh, as we mentioned, value and information from the data, and actually to have available this type of data, the information, uh, anytime, anywhere. So the COVID-19 has reinforced the potential of this technology and what means to be able, you know, to move data, you know, and extract and generate value uh, from them. In particular, uh, you, we mentioned, you know, the connectivity, so the 5G, you know, and the 5G appear today as a new revolution in communication and connectivity. You know, just a couple of numbers, I mean, it's going to be 100 times faster than 4G and it's going to be 200 times lower in terms of, of latency. So it allowed to take, uh, you know, the digital economy to a further new level uh, of connectivity and integration and filling those gaps uh, and need that was not found, that has not found uh, yet a complete answer, you know. And as a matter of fact, you know, in the industrial world, in addition today of the uh, basic wireless uh, connectivity, that is something that, let me say, is already almost well established, there is a, a growing demand for remote access to machine and, and system, you know, and definitely it's increasing. So five, five G network mobile can respond to this, uh, mobile network can respond to this type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, needs and request and can be used uh, to connect machine and system over long distance, uh, you know, as a, for example, as between different countries, you know, or across, uh, across countries. So even Maurizio, if I can just um, ask a question on 5G. So obviously there there are different parts, aren't there? There's the the 5G um, networks that have to be installed by the telcos, the telecoms companies, and then there's the 5G capacity at the you know the ultra fast capacity of sensors and software at the user end. Um, where how how well set up are we with 5G? I mean it's new. And we've been hit by COVID. That's hit government spending budgets. Um, is there a lot? To, you know, I, I know that in the UAE and Saudi we have good telecoms capacity. But is five G something that's going to be here tomorrow, or what's the timeline for this? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, timing is definitely is is, is not really an issue. But you say. Unfortunately, the, all the advances in digital as well on you know, the 5G uh, won't, won't be really visible you know, in a very short time. So the, the extensive adoption of, in, in, uh, of the digital in the industrial plant, uh, uh, as we know, you know uh, just to, to avoid the rhetoric, uh, is still facing some kind of reluctancy by the plant owner. You know? And uh, you know, to win this type of reluctancy, actually, uh, we may... You, we need to engage actually the available plant owner to, to prototype and test the digital application uh, as well as the 5G, obviously, and uh, for the control of the plant. So we, they can have a clear, you know, um, uh, evidence of uh, the, achieve, the, uh, the achievement uh, and uh, about the robustness of the, of the solution that we can propose. But on the other side, as you mentioned, you know, the, this type of scenario, the evolution of digital and 5G need, uh, you know, the public type of network, but also the private type of network. And right now, you know, there are still requirements in terms of regulation, in terms of technology development, uh, you know, to really reach uh, a full maturity. However, some steps are done along the way. For example, there are already available on the market router that are able to connect 4G and 5G 
in a kind of integration of public and private network on both, you know, uh, the type of, of, the, of the generation. And, and by the way, let's mention that, you know, it's expected you know, from the an analyst that, uh, you know, anyway, the, the world is moving. And uh, by the end of this year, uh, more than half a billion, you know, devices will be already connected in 5G. So, you know, we are anyway moving uh, uh, along that path. Okay. And then on, so you talked there about the owners investing in digital and there's some reluctance, but presumably that is changing you talked about the need for the sort of public networks, the data infrastructure. Uh, what about skills? So obviously you can have the technology, you can have the infrastructure, but the, the data skills, the digital skills are different to traditional skills. Have we got um, a deficit in that area? And what, what do we need to do to fix that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not really a deficit, actually, it's an evolution, you know, as Max was mentioning, it's always an evolution, you know, using the digital. Uh, um, you know, looking to the evolution of digital application, we are really looking to the uh, digital worker of the future. Uh, and actually, we are uh, looking to the growth uh, of the remote assistance, uh, you know, by excellent center, uh, essentially. You know, we are trying, you know, to connect the world or to connect the dot, as we mentioned, even at a long distance. You know, for example, when carrying out, you know, maintenance or inspection of an equipment, the field operator today, you know, and, and in the future, uh, more with the 5G, you know, using a tablet or wearing a, an augmented reality device uh, can be assisted to the, uh, through uh, the overlay of uh, instructor and checklist, uh, you know, guiding the operation to be performed or whenever is needed for a more expertise uh, presence, uh, you know, an expert located remotely can assist the field operator and vocally or visually, you know, uh, interacting uh, through the, the augmented reality scenario. And this type of technology or application can be even used, you know, to train the operator offline on normal or abnormal type of procedures and process conditions. Okay, thank you very much, Maurizio. Um, if anybody has questions for uh, Maurizio, please use the panel on the right-hand side to send in your questions. Uh, I want to bring in uh, our final panelist of today. So Aldo Sebastiani is the Senior Vice President for Cybersecurity and for the Digital Competence Center at Leonardo. Uh, welcome, Aldo. Thank you very much for being with us and thank you for your patience. Uh, you've, um, you've sat quietly for, for 40 minutes there, so that's uh, very kind of you. Um, now, none of this would be achievable uh, without, obviously, a secure data infrastructure. So cybersecurity must be kind of front and center of people's minds. What, what, what are the, let's look at the risks. You know, what are the risks for having this interconnected digital infrastructure? And then how seriously are people, owners, taking cybersecurity? Okay. Uh, thank you, first of all, to invite me. It's a very uh, pleasure. And uh, nowadays, as uh, our panelists uh, already told before, the digital journey is uh, a data-driven uh, process. And uh, this data-driven process, the interconnection of infrastructure, digital plant, and so on, uh, need of uh, cybersecurity like element of uh, sustainability, because uh, we alert so much the surface attack of this uh, system and uh, we have to uh, protect uh, uh, this uh, this uh, factor. As usual, uh, the, the the stream is a tree uh, that is technology, because uh, as you know, uh, the the digital the plant and uh, the the current plant, the industrial plant, and all this stuff has a, a lot of uh, technology legacy uh, in terms of technology. And uh, when you expose this kind of technology in uh, interconnection and uh, in a data-driven uh, process where you need of uh, data just to apply new algorithm, for example, for artificial intelligence, for predictive maintenance and all this stuff, it's uh, really important to take into account that uh, this may be legacy technology have to be protected in a specific way and uh, respect to other uh, other. Uh, field like uh, business, financial, uh, and, and so on, that uh, uh, coming from IT, only IT environment and not uh, operation uh, environment like OT or uh, all the process that we are having uh, just to apply the cloud technology just uh, on uh, this uh, digital uh, process. Uh, so this is a, 
a very important point uh, related to technology that uh, we have to take in account uh, related to cyber security, but also the other stream that is the process, because uh, the process change uh, in a very deep way internally to the industrial plant just to follow uh, a data driven uh, process and uh, also this process have to need to be updated in terms of cyber security taking consideration cyber security uh, for uh, several aspects uh, one of the aspects that uh, according to me it's really important to mention it at this a procurement process for example of this uh, this uh, this plan because uh, as we uh, could see in in the last period, uh, we have had a lot of attack coming from the supply chain because a uh, supply chain nowadays uh, is becoming uh, a problem because track tractor uh, make <coughs> are becoming more efficient and more uh, and have a more impact in uh, in uh, organization exploiting supply chain because they can reach more target in the in the same time and they can reach in a deep way just to think if they're able to attack a, a software company that provider software for industrial plant for example or for a legacy or physical sensor and so, so, on. What, so what you're saying now though is that from a plant owner point of view it's not just about your own cyber security it's the whole ecosystem of your supply chain and everyone who's in feeding in so you have to think holistically uh, absolutely so technology first of all and all the industrial plant with the cyber security security by design inside just to solve problem in terms of technology the process and uh, also the, the the people because uh, the other the other point uh, is have to be uh, increase through the time the, the awareness of the people, the training uh, to the people just to use uh, this new digital plan, but also people just to, to, to have to be capable to protect this, uh, this system and to have uh, the, the, all the, the, the instrument tools uh, just to, to do that. If, if very, just, uh, uh, we heard from Giovanni, he mentioned uh, blockchain. And then generally, we're seeing a lot more uh, services going into the cloud. So are cloud-based services and blockchain, are these much more secure? And I'm thinking more about cloud than blockchain. Is cloud as secure as in situ security? But um, uh, as I told before, uh, is uh, the cloud uh, is another part that is adding to the ecosystem because uh, uh, so far maybe we had a uh, IT uh, IT element and the OT element not interconnected now we have uh, IT OT and and cloud that they are uh, over connected uh, through them and the, and uh, and the attack can come from the the cloud and cloud the functionality and so on from IT so the problem is not the cloud itself or IT itself or T itself, but the problem is have to be capable to have uh, a situation awareness of the all the chain and they have to be capable to detect at that level uh, a, a possible attack uh, in, uh, in the ecosystem. So this is important. This is the, the reason because also with Tecmond, Leonardo and so on, is start the partnership to to start with the security by design and to take in consideration from the beginning in, in this plan or the, all these aspects in a cross-functional way. Okay, and then <laughs> one final question from me. Um, you know, you've talked about a holistic change of mindset and, and Max and Giovanni, and in fact, Maurizio, everybody has talked about this. So the question in my mind is how ready are the owners and operators in the Middle East to make this change? You know, what is the mindset that you are experiencing or the attitudes that you are experiencing in the Middle East region from plant owners? Are, are people aware of how important this is and what they need to do? And uh, people uh, is, um, is, uh, is aware, but uh, uh, have to overcome uh, the resistance of uh, current organization to the digital transformation in term, uh, in term of also security. So, so this, this is a, a, a big point. And uh, like in the other country, 
a big problem is the skill gap. This is uh, one of the big problem now nowadays because uh, just to apply all, all this all this stuff. So uh, from one side, skill gap to to design and to provide uh, uh, functional uh, and uh, industrial solution, but also to manage it in terms of cybersecurity. So what uh, where to invest also is uh, in the training awareness and system, also to exercise uh, the the possibility to manage uh, a, a cyber attack. Because nowadays, uh, as uh, all uh, people know, uh, it's not a problem to suffer a, of a, cyber, a cyber attack or to receive a cyber attack. But the problem is to manage in, in the current in the, in the current way and have to be ready. So people have to be trained uh, from the beginning with the cyber attack, have an assessment of the plant and have a clear picture of the plant, what they have to do in terms of technology process and so on. And in the time of uh, attack, they have to execute. We have to know to... So this is like a, like a traditional fire drill or a cyber attack. Yeah. And, exactly. and do people do that? Is that I mean, I, I've never heard of cyber drills or cyber attack drills. Are people doing that today? Or is this something that people have to start thinking about right now? But... Uh, this is a, another another uh, big problem. Uh, is a, a culture a culture, and uh, it's, it's better to call it a attitude. Attitude to think that uh, the attack is uh, always in place because uh, the threat actor can be inside the system uh, in 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 any time and uh, apply techniques like threat hunting uh, that permit to to search. And to monitoring and to detect and uh, to make in proactive way a lot of technique of security to to find and to prevent the attack itself, but also the cultural mind that uh, manage in a, a, a cyber attack is a normal activity. It's not a extraordinary activity, and so people have to be ready to make all the step of the process of cyber attack without any no panic and no no critical situation and so on and this will make the difference in the next future just in terms of cyber security because where we have uh, people ready to execute and to be prepared to manage this kind of stuff the, the attack have a, a little impact in the other case we have a, a lot of problem because uh, we lose a lot of time before to be active and to be efficient in in, in the management of that attack itself. Fantastic. Well, thank you, for Aldo. Uh, for your comment. Um, I'm going to open up the conversation now to questions uh, for the panelists. We have several questions that have come in already, um, but with 15 minutes to go, if you have further, or 10 minutes to go, if you have further questions, please send them in now. Uh, and we will get them into the conversation. Uh, Giovanni, I want to come to you first. We have a question here uh, from uh, Amit, uh, and he says, how challenging uh, is it going to be for you as an EPC uh, to, to make this shift to deliver the future industrial plants? You know, how big a challenge is that from a corporate strategy point of view? Thank you, Richard. I, I will start uh, from uh, what Aldo was saying before. The first, uh, the first challenge for us is the people. You know, we have uh, a unique opportunity, a unique privilege. We are writing a new book. And the people sometimes are scared about the white piece of paper. So what I'm, uh, the first challenge is to retrain our people in our industries with the new paradigm. So I, we are spending, I'm spending a lot of my time convinced the structure to move, to change, to evolve. Because you, there are no return on our decision. No return. Can come from the states, can come from the, uh, the federation of states, but there are no return. Electrical vehicle, new paradigm of energy is that. You need to change the people. Second, the one of the challenges to go to the new plant is to understand that the reaction side is not the, the core anymore of the plant. To produce hydrogen or to produce ammonia or to make the chemistry as it was, nothing changed. 
What is a big, the big mania is in dealing with electrical power. So the people can understand that to build a 3,000 per day ammonia plant, that is a, a standard plant in our industries for fertilizer or for any other petrochemical uses. If you start with the grid for electricity and get hydrogen for the water, is 1.6 gigawatt. 1.6 gigawatt is the power that now the city like Milano is absorbing to the national grid. So you are dealing with a totally different power. So it is uh, that if the electromechanics, the electronics, the control, the network, it was something that was business usual, now become at the same level of the chemistry. So you are really creating a new paradigm in mixing the energy balance and it and material balance. So when you are presenting our documents to the clients, we have two documents. The heat material balance, nothing new under the sun, but the energy balance. How we are gonna deal with 1.6 gigawatt from the net or from wherever it comes from. So that is uh, the, 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 the paradigm. The last but not the least, the new kind is not, could not be Middle East because Middle East obviously enjoy a, a, a let's say, unique position there. But in the other countries, for sure, the industrial, the economy scale is something that is becoming a little bit not the ruling condition. We will be, we will move through economy, there will be a distributed plan because uh, it's a more, again, relevant to the district. So you need to deal with the district and uh, be more local. Then we will see in the US, we will see in Europe, we will see perhaps in Asia. Middle East enjoy the point to be a big hub to serve a new kind of energy in the new forms for uh, such a big consumer that are visited. Not to forget that we have uh, 5 billion of people they still don't have electricity. So we need to also to deal with that. Because we are South America, we are Africa, with the area, they are still rural, but they need to have to access what we are enjoying today. So also that is a new market, enormous market that we are trying to, to understand how to involve in our growth in our market. Okay. Again. Thank you, Giovanni. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. I have a few more questions, so I'm going to, I'm going to push on with the questions. Um, I have one here on cybersecurity for Aldo. So uh, this is from, uh, from William. Um, Aldo, does the integration of 5G in a plant pose a significant cybersecurity challenge? Um, how serious is the threat of, this is the same question, how serious is the threat of an attack on industrial control system. So I guess that sort of follows on from your point. Uh, this is uh, an, another, uh, a very good question because uh, 5G it means uh, uh, interconnection, first, first of all, uh, and uh, uh, IoT uh, world, because uh, when you have a 5G, you have the possibility to connect all the world of machine to machine in industrial plant. So uh, you, again, uh, have a, a new surface attack that you will expose uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, scenario. And uh, when you have uh, all the, this point, interconnection, uh, machine to machine environment, that also means uh, a lot of new technology in terms of application. And uh, that, that means that the cybersecurity, again, uh, is a, is another uh, big uh, big point to to solve and to put in place. How is possible to to do that? From uh, uh, one specific point, uh, for example, machine to machine means that all these device that uh, before have no uh, functionality of security because they didn't think uh, to be connected and to be connected in uh, the large bandwidth have to be. Uh, make secure by design and to have the, the design, the sensor and all the, the stuff uh, uh, um, that have already embedded the capability in the secu uh, for security. And this is the, the, the first point. In terms of uh, communication, so a large new bandwidth and so on means new services 
and so again impact the inter uh, the complete ecosystem so from this point of view we have to move some of uh, uh, some of uh, uh, functionality of cyber security not only in the old uh, process but in the new process that so far uh, didn't impact uh, in, in any in any way so you have to redesign uh, all the architecture of cybersecurity to manage uh, this new uh, complex scenario okay thank you very much and so i guess that brings in the feed part of the process as well but we that's maybe for another day that conversation um i have a question here giovanni i'm going to put this to you it's from andrea uh, she says are clients directly requesting this transition in their contracts or does it have to come from the epc contractors proposing these new solutions you know what, what, what's driving the transformation is it clients or contractors no, I would say both. As a, um, there was, we can be influencer. So I told to my people, it's the time that we have to be influencer. And we can drive the transformation and you can educate the clients. But there are times they already recognize it. They already, you can already read in the, in the tender documents, let's say blue book documents, uh, clients that are requiring require advanced uh, digitalization, a twin digitals, or cybersecurity, how we can uh, assure the cybersecurity suite inside the plants. And uh, so this is something that the, the culture is growing. But in the same time, we want to be influencer and educate and move and push the, 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 our industry to evolve. Because believe, I truly believe if I compare our industry with the automobile industry or aeronautic industries, we are far beyond what uh, the, 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 the other, uh, let's say, peers in the industrial side are doing today. Okay, so, um, okay. It's, it's thank really you, Giovanni. I'm going to push on to another question for Maurizio. Uh, Maurizio, this question comes from Mohammed. Uh, um, how soon can we equip the labor, the workforce, to use technologies such as you know, machine learning and predictive maintenance? Uh, you know, how, how fast can we upscale? Uh, you know, how fast? Again, uh, I mean, I'm coming to the point that has been already mentioned by the other speakers. Uh, you know, it's a question of, uh, first of all, your people, you know, of uh, training the people and actually to, as we mentioned in uh, uh, before, uh, you know, to the wind, there is some uh, reluctancy of the people. In terms of technology, we are already there. Today, there is uh, an evolution of this technology. I mean, the technology, let me say, is ready. The technology is available. Actually, we are moving. Uh, this type of technology to be even better and faster because, I mean, with the 5G, that will be improved. But as we mentioned, it is a matter of time rather than, I mean, matter of time, not really with technology constraint today, but with a, a mindset evolution of people and mindset evolution of, of, the, of the plant owner. So technology-wise, uh, we, we are ready. Uh, technology is uh, always moving and improving. 5G is a proof, but, uh, you know, still uh, there is uh, uh, some reluctancy to win and some mindset uh, to, you know, uh, to form on, on that side. Okay, thank you. Now, final question from Max. Um, this is actually from two people, Belen and Samir. Uh, so I'm going to merge these questions. Max, in this 30% saving of efficiency by 2030, what is going to be the breakthrough moment? When you know what is going to be that turning point where we know we're on the right track and it's going to get us there? Is there a is there is it five G? Is it uh, cybersecurity? You know, is it skills? What what's the key thing? I think that uh, the moment is now. Time is now. Uh, as as this conversation uh, clearly states, uh, if we put together. Uh, an asset owner with a vision, like Giovanni was saying, the asset owner are ready to do that. An EPC contractor, a contractor that performed the integration work, valuable partners uh, like Aldo, uh, Maurizio, the technology is there. So the, if I, if, I may, if I may say the breakthrough is 
not one single technology, as we discussed, to get to that 30%, but it's the ability to connect the dots. There are uh, the situation, the condition, the technology, and the value chain that uh, can really connect the dots and get to this uh, 30% by 2030, starting from now, no doubt. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. Um, so if you have enjoyed today's conversation, please keep the questions coming. Um, Mead and Mayor Technomont are working on a report uh, on this topic of the future of industrial plants, which we will publish uh, in early November in advance of the ADIPEC exhibition. So watch out for that. Uh, we will keep you informed. Um, thank you very much for joining us today and for your questions. But most important of all, thank you very much to our panelists, to Giovanni, to Aldo, to Max and to Maurizio. You've been wonderful and we really appreciate having your time and expertise today. So thank you, gentlemen. And I look forward to seeing you all sometime soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.